the gold price is a reflective of the weakness of the financial system and the geopolitical disturbances that are occurring. The East has been the big buyer of gold. The West has been a seller. Now the West is finding that maybe we've been wrong and that we should be increasing our share of gold to our dollar reserves. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, the CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this conversation. And today we welcome back Simon Hunt of Simon Hunt Strategic Services. Really looking forward to this conversation. Last few last few weeks, we've, we've talked a lot about gold and silver. Today, we're going to zoom out dramatically. We're going to talk geopolitics because to quote my guest here, everything evolves around geopolitics, the markets, financial system, everything is based on geopolitics. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I just warned him, I've got four hours of questions lined up and we're trying to squeeze everything into 45 minutes minutes here. So uh, bear, bear with us. I think it's going to be a densely packed conversation. Before I switch over to my guest, a quick reminder, kindly hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave a comment, leave a like, of course. It helps us tremendously. Bring guests like Simon on and helps us ask the right questions. Let us know what do you want us to ask in, for future conversations. So thanks so much for that. Now, Simon, it is my pleasure to welcome you back here on the channel. It is good well, to see you again. Thanks for making the time. Good, good, good morning and thank you for having me. Uh, absolute pleasure, Simon, because uh, I really enjoy our conversations because I always tremendously learn a lot. And uh, just preparing for this conversation, I actually found some news articles that, uh, what do we call it? It's like, don't make mainstream news or headlines anymore. And uh, it's it's geopolitical. And uh, maybe just an example, the Middle East, I was wondering, where did the Houthis go? Right. And uh, it's got awfully quiet here in Western media about it. And then I Google it, the Houthi attacks, and uh, there were just attacks a couple of days ago, and they don't make mainstream news anymore. So we'll, we'll start on the geopolitics. Quick intro here from me, but uh, how is the geopolitical situation in the world right now, Simon? Uh, <laughs> where do I start? Um, I, can can I, I, I think... give you pointers real quick? Because I outlined three areas of interest for me. China, Taiwan, the Middle East, and then Russia, Ukraine, I think is the big one. So I'm curious if we were to go through them. Well, let's, let, let's try and put all those together. Um, I think what one what we can observe is that since President Xi and President Putin met in China, there has been a hardening in attitude from those two countries to America and NATO. Soon after Putin left China, China conducted a mock-up blockade exercise over Taiwan, both sea and air. And soon after Putin returned to Moscow, what did we see? But Putin setting out significant red flags, particularly following Ukraine bombing and hitting two long range ballistic radar systems uh, in Russia designed to warn of incoming ballistic missiles from anything from a thousand to two thousand kilometers away and thus nothing to do with the war over Ukraine. So obviously the West's uh, PR is this was a rogue Ukrainian attack. BS. How can it be when they will have been using missiles from NATO member countries and the surveillance satellites that guide the missiles, missiles 
to their targets. So where are we now? Um, if we start with, with China, China's defense minister at the Shangri-La Dialogue Conference this last weekend made some very strong and aggressive statements about China's red line over Taiwan and globally. And in fact, talking to a Chinese friend of mine in Shanghai this morning, he said the Chinese media were full of this more aggressive attitude that China is adopting towards America and its allies. In the Middle East, it's interesting that the new proposal put together by Qatar and Egypt and America was never supposed to have been released by America as Israel had not even seen it. So the Israel re, Israel's reaction was very clear, denouncing it. And certainly listening to the ex-IDF and Mossad um, agents at a high level being interviewed on Israeli 24 News, this is, there will be no ceasefire over Gaza until Hamas has been completely eradicated. So forget any peace proposal over Gaza. And when it comes to the northern border, Hezbollah, it's highly unlikely that any diplomatic solution over Hezbollah and Lebanon will be successful, successful either for the Lebanese or, or uh, the Hezbollah, nor even on the Israelis' side. Don't forget that somewhere between 60 and 80,000 Israeli settlers have not been able to return to their homes. So where is this leading us to? I think it goes back to the meetings between Putin and Xi in Beijing. Obviously, we don't know what was actually said but from various uh, comments that have come out of the meet, of the meet, of the dialogue, one can infer that there is a harder stance being taken by the two countries towards NATO, America, and its allies. We come back to our basic premise, which which is has always been that America has wanted to dismember Russia, to gain control of Russia's natural resources, and in so doing would then solidify its he he hegemonic status. Ukraine was just a stepping stone towards that objective. Now being defeated on the battlefield in Ukraine, NATO, in our view, has switched attention. Instead of a war being waged in Ukraine, it will be waged directly against Russia.
I come back to an unreported meeting which occurred early in May between NATO and government representatives when NATO apparently actually stated that to the government representatives that we are planning an attack on Russia and thus therefore you should advise your populations to stockpile essential goods like food. Quite obviously, if I knew about it, then Moscow knew about it. The sense, and I repeat, the sense that we get from putting all the dots together and from bits and pieces that we hear is that Russia is preparing to mount a major attack on some, on one or more NATO countries of sufficient destructive power that either Washington and NATO say enough is enough or else they retaliate. But retaliation against the message being sent would be difficult to mount. Thus, I think that following such an attack, this is my guess, is that Washington and NATO, with an election coming in America and across Europe, that the response is going to be, we get the message, but it gives us three or four years to prepare for any major retaliation that we might want to make. When it comes to China and Taiwan, Quite clearly, as I stated earlier, China's stance has hardened. It's hardened because they see America sending offenses, offensive weaponry into Taiwan and America sending a contingent of Greenberry troops to the Kinmen Island which is only a couple of kilometers off the coast of China. So without knowing whether anything will happen, there is a risk that in these circumstances that China will launch a blockade of Taiwan, so preventing the import and export of essential goods. I need not explain if that did happen, I emphasize if that did happen, that the chip sector and the semiconductor and other tech sectors would blow up sometime in the second half of this year. So that's a short overview as to how we see events evolving at the moment. That is a very grim picture, Simon. And uh, I've taken two pages of notes while you were talking, and uh, it is <laughs> awfully scary, I have to admit. But uh, I, I want to break that down just a little bit and maybe um, talk about potential triggers, perhaps. And one one thing I wrote down is the U.S. election you mentioned as well. And there seems to be quite a bit of confusion within the U.S. about what is happening uh, over the next, what is it now, six months maybe, or even five months until, what is it, May 4th, I believe, or the elections, May 8th, uh, November 8th, sorry, November 4th or 8th. Um, 
since Trump was spo- uh, was was convicted uh, as well. Like no sentence has been spoken yet, but uh, he has he's a convicted felon now running for office. So there seems to be a lot of con- confusion within the U.S. For example, are there are there is there a chance that uh, opposing forces might use that to their advantage? I mean, I find it very interesting, if not amusing, that soon after he was convicted, he raised $200 million. (laughs) Um, I mean, I think the bigger picture, as you've seen, um, civil disturbances rising very rapidly within America. And if Trump were to be jailed, emphasis, if he were to be jailed, I think it's the trip, the trigger, my own feeling is, is that it would be a trigger for civil war. Um, There's so many permutations about the election who is going to be the candidate on on both parties? Will an independent like Bobby Kennedy make it? But really, I don't want to get into that discussion. No, we we don't have to. It's, it's more a question: Is does the U.S. seem weak and vulnerable right now? And, and is China and Russia are taking advantage of that because they're so busy with internal politics and a, a president who's above age, he should be to, to run a country, to be honest. Like, of yeah, course, he's, I, he's got his helpers, but and advisors. But uh, is, is that a... Is if, it, you, if you listen to the military experts that I listen to, like Colonel Douglas McGregor, Scott Ritter, Larry Johnson, Ray McGovern, et cetera, America is weak. It's not a strong nation. And uh, Russia now has a battle-hardened, modernized army. China is making rapid strides in that direction, particularly in seafair, as America's commander, naval commander, Uh, for the Pacific just said the other day that China has made rapid uh, advances in naval warfare. So what occurred, what the situation used to be 10 odd years ago is no longer the same one today. We, We let them catch up. Quite, quite early, and uh, it, it happened. Um, they weren't going to sit idle anyway. Like, what did we expect? I'm sorry, say that again. No, it was like China was able to catch up, obviously, and uh, NATO yes, superpower yes. building, like uh, aircraft carriers, for example, yeah, 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 that yeah, number yeah, has yeah. been growing steadily. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. what what did we expect? And we, I mean, the West expect China to do. They they weren't just going to sit idle, obviously. Well. China has always been a peaceful nation. It's been the nation that's been invaded, had two centuries of being invaded and dominated by the West. It doesn't want confrontation. It says so all the time, and you have to believe it. It's not in their culture. But when push comes to shove, they will respond. And I think they will respond very aggressively. The key question is, we are heading to a crisis, both for Russia and China. And does this permutation imply that peace evolves out of the crisis? Or does war emanate from it? I keep coming back to, first of all, America's historic objective of dismembering Russia and gaining control of its natural resources. 
Ukraine was the stepping stone. They failed there. Are they now going to directly attack Russia as the NATO meeting implied? So I would have to, I think the odds are even money that Russia is going to launch an attack in advance of NATO's own attack. And it's maybe six to four against that out of the crisis peace evolves. Those are the sort of odds I would be looking at. And I have to ask like motive, like in uh, so, sort of like the same question I've asked about Hamas attacking Israel, like what is Russia expecting to gain out of it? Uh, as well, like what what did Hamas expect to get out of the attack against Israel? They obviously didn't expect a peace treaty right after the attack in October. So, what is Russia expecting to get out of a preemptive attack against NATO? So, uh, shock and I awe, think, maybe, but uh, it, it can't be peace. China and Russia would like to see peace behind the scenes. They've been negotiating for a two-state solution over Palestine. But it's been firmly rejected every time by Israel. Israel sees what's at stake for them is the existence of the state of Israel. So... Uh, what does Russia and China gain out of it? Um, I guess it's like it, in the end, in can, the can end, I jump in real quick, Simon, just just, just yeah. maybe to clarify, like it feels a bit like, uh, and a friend is a school teacher of mine, and uh, he told me a story the other day, like he teaches seventh graders, and there was a girl in his class that was bullied the whole like for for months on end, like completely harassed, and then eventually enough got enough, and she pushed the one of the boys that bullied her to the ground. The kid was crying for for weeks, and then the parents came running. But my point is. Is Russia that that girl that's being bullied, for example, the whole time, and eventually it'll just erupt, it'll just push back, maybe too violently? Are you talking about the Middle East? No, uh, uh, Russia, the Middle East. Like, I think you could generally apply that to to either, like, even even China and Taiwan. Well, as I've said before, the West has triggered Russia's red line. The West is in the process of triggering China's red line. And as I said before, the odds are even money that Russia and China are going to push very hard. In other words, there's this big risk that uh, Russia will mount this attack. And secondly, I don't think it's even money but it's not too far off even money that China will be forced to make an aggressive move so that it thwarts any Taiwan or America's push towards Taiwanese independence. From the Middle East's point of view, they, they don't want confrontation in the Middle East, but the West apparently does, and Israel for its own existence does as well. How is Russia and China going to respond? The first thing that we have to watch closely is if there is a defense alliance signed between Russia and Iran. As I know it as so far, I understand that that alliance has not yet been signed. But if it were to be signed, then 
any attack launched on Iran would immediately bring Russia into the equation and probably China mm -hmm. too. Um, I mean, the Gulf countries are having to walk a very fine line given the Muslim population in both their countries and on the other side that their defenses are entirely dependent upon America, both in terms of equipment, um, uh, repairs, up to dates, and the location of physical military people. So I, my guess is that it's going to require the crisis in the Middle East, should there be an attack on Iran for the Gulf countries to force the exit of the colonialists. What you're seeing ever since the summit meeting in Riyadh in what was it in, in October, November last year, the Arab leaders coming to Riyadh and being greeted warmly by MBS. So I think over the next two to three years, there are going to be major changes in the Middle East as Gulf countries are basically saying, we've matured enough so that we can look after our own problems and we don't want the interference of the old colonial countries very, very interesting because that leads me that's a, that's actually a perfect segue almost to to the financial market and financial market discussion uh de-dollarization the rise of gold uh BRICS currency but i'm gonna like Take a, take a two-second break and just come back to two more things you said earlier. Uh, or one more thing you said earlier, and then I have a follow-up question. Um, you mentioned because of the U.S. election, the retaliation would take three to four years, if I, if I wrote that down correctly, uh, for, for NATO or the U.S. to retaliate a Russian attack on, on a NATO member country. Can, can you clarify that? That's just for my own understanding. What do you mean by a three- to four-year retaliation? <coughs> um, it gives... It gives NATO member countries the time to rebuild their stockpiles of military equipment, which have been severely eroded as they're basically being emptied into Ukraine. Um, and to prepare tactically for any attack. Hence, it's going to require two or three years to do that. Would that be post attack or before an attack? Just curious, just, just to clarify, Simon. That would be before an attack, but okay. NATO made. Before NATO re retaliates meaning. Like, so let, yeah. let's assume like worst case, it, the attack happens tomorrow. You'll think it'll be two to three, maybe four years before NATO member countries can actually like retaliate that's, properly. That's my, that's, that's my guess. Okay. emphasize that's my guess in other words the attack if it happens that russia makes will be destructive enough for washington and nato countries to say enough is enough and it will give them time to prepare for a bigger confrontation later on no, I appreciate you clarifying that. Okay, scary, but uh, we have to look at the facts here. <laughs> so, um, and, and one more follow-up question on the Israel conflict is uh, the position of Netanyahu, the president of Israel. Like, how, like, w what happens if there is a change politically in, in Israel? What do you expect? I was just Googling his approval ratings. Apparently, they're coming up again, but... Uh, just, a diff just a different figurehead. Okay. So, he's just... Uh, again... Well, 
Netanyahu is is recognizing what the majority of Israel want, which is ownership of Palestine. Okay, so he, it, it doesn't matter who who's leading the country. In my it, view, the, the goal my... is the same. Okay. Yeah, goal okay. is the same. Awesome. No, okay, no, not not awesome, but uh, no, I appreciate you clarifying that. And uh, it was just a, a question that popped into my head because Netanyahu was a, his name was dropped, you know, in, in several news articles about it and uh, his approval rating. So I'm curious sure. what what his sure. position in that would be. Um, I, I mentioned we, we got to find a segue to the financial markets and how that sort of, uh, you know, comes back to, or is being reflected. The whole geopolitical situation is being reflected in the financial markets. Um, let, let, let's talk about that, like financial markets, like. Where, where do you see the geopolitics being reflected the most right now? <clears throat> Frankly, it's not. Hmm. Markets are so complacent. The future, you look at any investment bank or broker analysis on anything, there's no correction for goodness knows, well, at least no correction before 2030. And some say no correction before 2040. I mean, everything has been priced in for the perfect world. And the world is not perfect, as we've been talking about. So at the moment, um, the, the geopolitical crisis is not being reflected in stock markets. What's going to change it? First of all, if you look beneath the hood, America's economy is actually weakening quite rapidly, whether it be on consumer spending, uh, whether it be in housing, uh, whether it be in retail sales, or whether it be in employment. And the market reflects what is announced on GDP. But if you look at gross domestic investment, which is supposed to marry up to what the GDP data says, it doesn't, there's a massive gap. GDI last year rose by only 0.5%, not 2.5%. In the first quarter, I don't yet have the exact figure, but it was significantly below the, G the announced GDP figure. And then if you look at the inflation numbers, they're all hogwash. If you go back to how the CPI was worked before Arthur Burns in the 1970s started playing around with the compilations. Today's GDP, which was followed up by successive administrations, but if you go back to the original workings, CPI today is around 12%. And then if you look at the survey which a group called the Chapwood Group does twice a year, where they survey 500 common items in 50 different towns and cities. The last survey showed <coughs> prices rising by 10%. So forget 3%. And then if you look at the number of restaurant chains shutting down is phenomenal. So what I'm saying is, uh, to repeat what Daniel D. Martina Booth, who is a real expert on all of this, says, actually, once uh, the official data is released, we will find that America actually entered a recession in October last year. So what I'm saying is, 
we are, if we're not in recession now, we are on the verge of it. And that over the next couple of months, we will see the official data being significantly revised down to the point that markets realize, oh, things are not that good and that we are in recession. The problem, and, and that's not only reflective in America, but in America too, all the manufacturing surveys are very negative. And even uh, some of the um, regional bank uh, service uh, surveys in the last month showing, showed a very significant drop. And in Europe, manufacturing is still in recession. Services have improved, but I maintain that that reflects the strength of equity markets. And when equity markets start falling, so will the services. And in China, <coughs> business, other than in a few selective sectors, is very weak. And you can see it in the physical base metal sectors, very weak. Confirmed by chats I had this morning in, in China. In Japan, question mark. How strong is the economy? So if, as I expect, that there will be a geopolitical shock, probably before October, that's going to create big corrections in equity markets globally. And we would have, I think we are in the point of seeing the last 5% rise in most of the American indices, whether it be S&P, the Dow, or the FANGS index, and then if you look at the banking index, the KM, KMB index, it looks shockingly weak, suggesting that we've got more bank failures to come in the second half of the year, and probably more corporate failures too, and bigger ones. Don't forget all we've seen so far has been the low hanging fruit that have failed. The bigger fruit higher up the tree takes longer uh, for the rise that we've seen of about five percentage points in interest rates to work way, their way through the bigger companies and banks. But I think that the second half of this year, that's what we're going to see. So at the same time, the Fed is in a quandary. Uh, inflation is ticking up. They know what's coming down the pipe. And on the other hand, they see weakening employment. My personal guess, nothing more than that, is that we won't see any cut in Fed interest rates until the early months of next year, when there is a different administration. I didn't say a new one, I said a different one. And that is when I think that both the Fed and other central banks will unleash huge monetary stimulus at the same time that governments uh, take up the cudgel as well with more fiscal stimulus, which then leads us into the dollar becoming very weak, 
inflation surging, particularly food and energy prices. And it will lead to a recovery in business activity, but inflationary driven. What does that mean? It means that households see inflation rising, so they buy more than their current consumption. What does manufacturing do? It does the same thing. It increases its stocks of everything because they see a falling dollar and they see rising inflation. So what we will then see, where are we now, 24, 25, we will see in the second half of 26, probably, possibly early 27, in global inflation, probably 15% plus, US inflation, 13% plus, what we saw in 1981-82. And what did the bond vigilantes say? They will hate that scenario. Long bonds will rise sharply. We have long bonds probably by the end of 27, if not earlier, over 10%, well over 10%. What does that do to a highly indebted system? Crash. So we expect to see at best rolling recessions for five odd years and perhaps depression before we finally get out of the quagmire. Debt will have been washed out and we will then have 20, 30 years of sound, equitable growth, not driven by debt. There's one factor I've not mentioned, which one should, is the imposition of central bank digital currencies, which is probably coming. But before that can happen, the banking system has got to be shut down. So whether that happens as a result of a cyber attack by Russia stroke China, or whether it happens by the own in, their own intelligence services doing it in order to shut the banking system down, um, and when reopened, introducing central bank digital currencies. So there you are. This is my take. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot to take in and digest. I have to admit, I'll probably have to sleep over this, Simon, and come back with some follow-up questions tomorrow. But uh... <laughs> 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 no, but but all kidding aside, Simon, was like, a really comprehensive picture and uh, I, I do have a couple follow-up questions because uh, I, I like to cherry pick of course my recession indicators and uh, uh, a couple of things I've been looking at of course is the copper price and then the 10-year yield and um, you, you you talked about the bond yields but my question is the US and at least the sentiment in the US and uh, was that a recession was imminent last year the recession fears seem to have subsided and if you put the copper price in the 10-year bond yields sort of over the sentiment chart, and I have yet to find one, by the way, it's like maybe my own personal sentiment chart here. Um, it, it really fits well, because copper trading around $5 a pound now, the 10-year yield rising again, meaning risk risk off, or no, risk on, risk, risk on. <laughs> I always confuse the two. So people flee, like they, they don't really look for safe haven or safe haven investments like, a bond, like US bonds at this point. So I'm curious, like how that relates to, to the recession fears here, like, what I'm looking at. Of course, I'm cherry picking uh, two indicators. I think what saved us from having a recession last year was the fiscal stimulus. Um, the real data is pointing towards recession. Don't, my advice is don't look on the jump in copper prices as being reflective of the fundamentals. It was virtually entirely driven 
by the funds and banks causing a huge squeeze on COMEX futures. Nothing to do with the fundamentals. Global physical consumption is weak. And the global copper fabricators are only expecting physical consumption to grow by less than 1% this year. There are supply problems. Um, short term, I think they've been magnified. So I'm um, certainly in the first quarter, the published data is showing there was a surplus. So I think that what we are going to see with physical consumption remaining in the doldrums and probably getting worse in the second half of the year as recession gathers pace, you have a big correction in equity markets, maybe 30 to 40 percent. That's going to unwind a lot of the spec long positions, positions held by funds, etc. So we would expect copper prices by early next year to be under $7,000. Then when the banks and the governments prevent any big systemic failure by pumping up the system again, then we will get prices at least doubling within two years to $14,000. I mean, the history of copper is such, it's part of the macro economy. Prices above $10,000 lead to substitution. It's already happening in EVs. The world's biggest producer of wiring for, uh, for EVs in particular, actually told an industry conference a year ago that 40% of copper used in wiring for EVs will be replaced by aluminium. And I mean, the bigger usages for transmission cables, low voltage underground cables, have already, I mean, over the years, you've seen less and less being used. If you get for copper prices over 10,000, there will be a jump to using aluminium. So it's not a one way street, which so much of the investment community believes copper is. It's a two way street, as it always has been. End of story. <laughs> no, I, I like the clarity here. And uh, I'm getting carpal tunnel from writing down so many notes here, Simon. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm to, sorry uh, about that. Uh, no, no worries. It's hugely insightful. I'm learning so much. That's why like, I need to bring you on more often here, Simon. It's hugely insightful for myself. I learn so much every time we talk. Um, allow me one very last question because we're running it. Uh, we, we've already passed the 45-minute mark here. But one last question, and I hope it's not too big of a question to answer, but... How geopolitical is the gold price right now? That's actually an easy question to answer. <laughs> the gold price is a reflective of the weakness of the financial system and the geopolitical disturbances that are occurring. The East has been the big buyer of gold. The West has been a seller. Now the West is finding that maybe we've been wrong and that we should be increasing our share of gold to our dollar reserves. 
in China ever since the Shanghai Gold Exchange was opened, I think it was in 2002, Chinese households and institutions have bought something like 23,000 tons from the exchange. About, where are we now? We're in about six months ago, the PBOC created a system whereby households can buy physical gold from the Shanghai Gold Exchange through their bank accounts. And in fact, even on an installment basis. It's also interesting that gold is being used in some cases as the instrument of creating, for instance, India to buy enough rubles in order to pay for their oil imports. And between, at least between Russia and China, with Russia holding a large surplus, trade surplus, it is gold being held in the PBOC that acts as the differential account. I think that's what we're going to see more of, which is that in one form or another, within the growing BRICS community of nations, that gold will be part of their monetary system. And it's likely that the BRICS membership will rise from 10 today to 40 within two to three years time. Then BRICS group of nations will be accounting for over half of the world's population and GDP, whereas at the moment it's only just under 30%. Don't ask me what the price will be. I'm not clever enough to answer that, but it'd be much higher than today. No, perfect. Simon, one, one last thing. India repatriated 100 tons of gold from the UK, I believe. A any significance in that? You mentioned using gold to sort of back yeah, up the oil trade. Um, it is. What happens? The gold gets resold to Russia. India receives rubles in return and can thus pay for its oil imports in rubles. Interesting. So really what gold is starting to do is replacing dollar in trade transactions. And I think that's why we're seeing gold being so steady yeah. and to a lot of ETF inflows, as you mentioned, I think the West is waking up. Um, to, to, to the situation, I think GLD has seen massive inflows over the last few weeks here. So it, it's trending that direction. There seems to be a new floor in the gold price for, for now. Until we see world yep. peace. <laughs> if if any of the when, patrons when. ever ever is right, uh, world peace is what we all wish for. And strive it's for. coming, but it's going to take a decade yeah. or so. Isn't Not it usually tomorrow. like a massive shock and then we get world peace? It's like That's my expectation. Something drastic needs to happen before we get to that stage. And I hate that drastic. Yeah, but as I said before, we get, we get a temporary peace for the West to rebuild its military reserves, personnel, equipment, and get their tactics. Except, so I, mean, I could discuss with you forever because war spending, like exactly what you mentioned, replenish reserves and all that, like it seems seemingly is pushing the recession further and further away because we're just throwing money at the no, problem. We're not. We're not. Right? There's a recession. So, we're almost in the recession now, and you will see it in a couple of months' time. 
Now we'll, we'll see how that plays out because I'm I'm actually in your camp. But then, as I said, like I look at these indicators, and all of a sudden it tells me the world is fine. The U.S. is dodging a recession despite massive debt problems. Right? Let's we haven't even talked about the U.S. debt situation and how strong that system is and how much more debt it can take at this point. So. Um, that that's a discussion for another day, Simon. But uh, I tremendously appreciate you coming on, and uh, it was hugely insightful. Where where can we follow your work, and uh, how can yeah, we get I, a hold of you? I was about to about to answer that question. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Simon Dash Hunt dot com. Fantastic. We we will link to that below because you do strategic advisory, okay. and uh, I know you've done yeah. some mining, uh, some strategic advisory also in the mining space on geopolitics. I believe yeah. as well. So yeah, hugely insightful. Simon, tremendously appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I can't wait for our next discussion and uh, stay safe well, in Dubai. I think you're, is, is, thank, is Dubai thank, Switzerland, thank by the way? Like, just curious, like, do you feel safe in Dubai? I feel very safe in Dubai. All families feel safe here. There is no crime. Hmm. You can send your kids to school walking without yeah. any fear, as friends, expat friends of no. mine I've done in bringing up families here. No, I, I meant more from a geopolitical side because you're so close to Iran, uh, for example. So I was like, I know Dubai itself is. I very safe. I, I think even if the, even if there's an attack on Iran, I'd feel safe here. It won't spill over. Okay. No, Simon, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, well, and uh, everybody thank else. You thank you so much me. for. Oh, Simon, any anytime, anytime. We need to catch up more often. And to everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in and tremendously appreciate yeah. your time watching this channel. Hope this was educational and informational. I think I've taken like four or five pages of notes here. Uh, hugely insightful discussion for me as well. I always learn so much speaking with Simon. If you enjoyed this conversation, kindly subscribe to this channel. Leave a thumbs up. That way we know we're bringing on the right guests. And uh, leave a like, leave a comment. We do want to hear from you. It helps us get this video out to a wider audience as well. And and uh, we'll stay tuned for more. We'll be back here on SOAR Financially. We have a tremendous lineup of guests in the coming weeks. And uh, we're not going to take a break for the summer. So we'll be back with lots more here on SOAR Financially. Thank you so much for watching.